Today on the show, we have Tessa Dunlop, author of the book, Elizabeth and Philip, a story of young love, marriage, and monarchy. Tessa is a historian, writer, and broadcaster that you may have seen on BBC, the Discovery Channel, and the History Channel. Elizabeth and Philip is her fifth book and her first about the royal family. And we loved reading about this love story, and we can't wait to talk more about it. So welcome to the show, Tessa. Hello, thank you so much. Okay, so we've heard the late queen refer to Philip as her strength and stay. At her coronation, he vowed to be her liege man of life and limb. But what would a monarchy under Queen Elizabeth II be without Prince Philip? And what did he really add to her reign? Well, it's interesting because when they got married, it was, I mean, the epoch for weddings, like never before in 19... 19- 47, 48, there was an unprecedented number of weddings post-war. Bagging a man was the most important thing a woman can do. Forget women's progress, etc. That came much later in the 60s, feminism. This was about bagging your man because they were a precious commodity, a fair few had died. And we also saw at the same time the age of the bride crashing to 22. So Elizabeth, was bang on trend. She was just 21 years old. She had her handsome prince who had got his, earned his um, accolades and uh, delivered as a hero should uh, in the Navy during the war. And what's interesting is, I think, because for our generation and those younger than us, we tend to think of Philip and Elizabeth as this old pair, the matriarch and her steady hand, you know, sort of holding down progress, not holding it down, but certainly shoring up tradition. But actually back then, at the beginning of their relationship, they were fresh. They were representative of their country at that time. Okay, it was Phil the Greek, so we'll skip over that. But they absolutely spoke to the young and with the young. And I think we have to really remember that, that at the beginning of Elizabeth's reign, she was something of a groundbreaker. She was a female head of state. We hadn't had one since Victoria. She was going to still be queen a female head of state, when we get our first female prime minister. This is epoch-changing times that the Queen is fronting as, ironically, this super-traditional head of this super-traditional institution. And there is this kind of wonderful rub there, and Philip allowed this to happen. It did cause ructions in their marriage, we'll come to that. But he allowed this to happen in this understated, evolutionary way that I think we need to remind ourselves in the same breath, right now you're having this big conversation, will you in America have your first female president? You know, and, it, and, and, and we got there so much earlier, and I'm sure one of the reasons is we had Margaret Thatcher and Dennis in Elizabeth and Philip decades earlier. Yes, they don't have political power, but there they were as this traditional symbol of what is possible when the gender roles are reversed. And I think that's, really key to hold on to. Yeah, and really, when you think of the late queen and Prince Philip, really in many ways, the two were opposites. And as you write in the book, there was Philip's characteristic bluntness and humor, neatly offsetting his wife's propriety and restraint. So we all know this is, you know, I think common knowledge at this point that opposites often attract. But what was it that made their marriage work? What was the cornerstone of their relationship that made it last so long? Elizabeth fancied Philip. Yeah. From, from the, the word go, uh, diary testimonies from friends of hers in Windsor, anecdotal staff from Corfi, her nanny. She absolutely found him a breath of very attractive fresh air. She is surrounded. I don't know if you know any um, aristocratic um, Brits sort of who are now being pretty much mothballed and are even being removed from the House of Lords, but they're they're generally not that attractive certainly not attractive (laughs) they tend to be lacking a chin look a little bit inbred sort of vague (laughs) in appearance if I'm honest with you girls so um she's surrounded by them they are the guards that are sort of left to shore up Windsor Castle during the war the teenage princess is bored to tears she's drawing dogs and riding ponies and we know the queen loved ponies but there's a limit And Philip, every time she meets him, which is sort of once every 18 months or so, as a relative of the family, because whether we find it distasteful or not, they were third cousins. Their families did interlink, as all royal dynasties did at that time. She just fancied the pants off him. 
Now, for Philip, he's five years older. So he meets her when she's 13, he's 18, something like that. Um, and then he keeps a very steady eye on her. Um, he's he's uh, an ambitious man. He's a man born with the hereditary heft of being a prince, but he's also a pauper. He has no realm, he has no money, his parents are separated, he, he's in chaos. And domestically, personally, and that must have made Elizabeth such an attractive prospect, not just her little domestic neat family, us four, you know, as, as George VI referred to them, her sister Margaret and that very steady, safe marriage between Elizabeth, the later Queen Mother and George, but also Elizabeth was heir to the largest realm on the planet at a time when almost all the great crowned heads of Europe had seen their dynasties topple. So I think it would be naive in the same way that I think we can recognize when a woman finds a man attractive, even today, because he's in a position of power, he has money, he has status, and that she will acquire um, when she marries him. What, why can't we also recognize that that might be part of the package that Philip bought into? Does that undermine their love or attraction for each other? No. You know, one does. If Imagine now, right now, that the man you love happens to be a cleaner, nothing wrong with being a cleaner. And now imagine for one second that he might be running for vice president and tell me which one you might find more sexually attractive. That's all I'm saying is Philip probably also, not only did she have a wonderful bust and a comely bosom and figure and have lovely peaches and cream complexion. No, she wasn't a stunning drop dead glamour model like some of the girls he had been dating because lest we forget, he was an older man relative to Elizabeth. But she had this thing he didn't have, this realm, this, this heritage this royal credibility. And so the combination of her fancying him, then both speaking the same language of monarchy and her actually having monarchy about to land in her lap. I mean, it's it's a kind of no brainer really, isn't it? Yeah, makes sense. Well, let's talk about what other people thought. So the then Princess Elizabeth met Philip as a young girl, as you said, and it was never anyone but Prince Philip for her. We all know that. And in many ways, they were destined to be together. But as you put it, not everyone was quite so enamored with Philip as Elizabeth was. So can you explain what you mean by that? There is a quote I use in the book. I can't remember off the top of my head, but something about the courtiers um, that hang around the royals are a bit like sort of fungus sometimes but I can't get rid of the whiff of them they're desperate clawing attention seeking um wannabe status and I think they were searingly protective of their what they saw as the, the nation's primary asset the, the future queen and they were deeply suspicious of Philip they thought he was something of a player famously it was said of him um, that he would never be faithful and that um, he was an opportunist who was marrying the queen for her jewels and take jewels as a metaphor for, for all that she came with and not for his pure unadulterated passion for her and I would say the two can't be separated that as I've just explained when we try and work out what we find attractive in a partner it is more than just pure sexual chemistry otherwise we're just you know fancy the lad on the lad on the street do, do, do you see what I'm saying sure so um I, I feel that he did get a rough time he was spoken to in a highly patronizing way I mean the stiffs in the palace I, I know I'm always being given hell for being too supportive or sympathetic to Harry but Harry talked about those stiffs and Philip had the exact same problem back in the, the late 1940s and 50s. And in fact, it was compounded by Winston Churchill. Now he's everyone's favorite Winston Churchill. He won the war and he's something of a national icon, but he would have liked to thank you very much have the young queen to himself as well. He was also distrustful of Philip who was seen as interfering, brusque, a little bit ill-mannered. He was entitled, Philip. You're not born a prince without having a heft of entitlement. He was also very good looking. Good looking princes tend to be entitled. So he did rub up people the wrong way but at the same time arguably he had a right to that entitlement more than once he had to remind courtiers that his grandmother had actually been born I can't remember if it was a Windsor Castle or, or Kensington Palace 
you know, and um, in fact, she had quarters, I think, in Kensington Palace and was born in Windsor Castle. I think that's the right way around. So this is a man, as I said, he was born of the man. He just, the hand he was dealt in terms of monarchy happened to be in Greece, one of the highly unstable at the time Balkan states. And he ends up exiting in an orange crate aged one. But you don't get, you don't iron out that blue blood. It doesn't ever go away. I can tell you that. So in a, in a weird way, it was kind of serendipitous that the two of them met. It mm -hmm. was also very, very fortunate that they had the break that was war. I mean, a break as in a sort of break on them, a BA, a B-R-A-K-E, a, a break on the culmination of their relation so that the, the young princess could be a little bit older. She was, you know, sort of 18, 19, 20. This was very clearly her decision. And what's interesting is in one of the first ever polls conducted by the British press, we know how notorious the British press are, there was this poll done. People would write in by hand. There was obviously no email or social media then. What they thought, and women in particular, were only concerned with whether they loved each other. Men were much more suspicious. You know, these British men who felt they'd fought for Britain and this bloody foreigner prince coming in and taking their princess, you know, all the sort of uh, raw, um, military brigade uh, feeling a little bit insecure post-war weren't as keen. But the women really bought into this idea of a an equal marriage. And when I say equal, still we've got the man who's the breadwinner and the, and the woman who tends to be at home, but an equal marriage in terms of the man and the woman having a sort of meeting of minds. And this was very vogue post-war and the assumption was that that was what Philip and Elizabeth had and people bought into that and I think in many respects you know they did Elizabeth was far more sheltered she was much younger so she did have to lean on Philip and that was no bad thing because we know that publicly Philip was going to be sort of ceremoniously humiliated all the time you know not because of the constitution because his wife was always number one because he had to bend the knee to this much younger less experienced woman in a country that was always gave him a pretty rough ride mm -hmm. and actually if we could go to the reception that he received in america may we do that sure because when they go on their first trip she's still princess and it's a sort of pop over they do to america um it's a tack on when they've gone to visit canada because the king he's got cancer i think it's 1951 and he's too sick to travel so they go in his in his place and they go to america and all the american press talk about this big blonde blue-eyed boy how he's just the perfect prince he's not got the waxy sort of tumbleweed look of British royalty they're really rude in fact about British royalty and there's something very live wire and alternative about Philip in comparison with this gauche princess who was anxious this was one of her first royal tours she doesn't really know the ropes Philip meanwhile you know he's earned his stripes in the navy he knows what to do he's he's he, he's a man who stood on his own two feet because he had to, you know, kicked out of his family who were all over the shop from a very young age. So what I find interesting about the American press's reception is the generous way in which they wrote about Philip. You never see that in the British press, not right through till the very end. You know, by the time he's in his 90s, we're like, oh, go on then, another gaffe from Philip, and we're sort of fond of him. But we never really fully embrace Philip in the way that, other people and other countries within the Commonwealth and in America do. You give him an equal hearing alongside the Queen. Well, speaking of people having doubts, so I know that you write in the book that King George VI even took his daughter on a royal tour with him to, to delay their engagement, which I think as we're speaking, we're speaking July 22nd, I think that their engagement anniversary was just a couple like a week ago or something like that it was it was within the last it was in july i believe and then so as you said in january 1947 the sunday pictorial stunned the nation with the headline should our future queen wed philip arguing that the people needed the chance to express their views which i'm not totally sure they did but but they but they did and ultimately of course spoiler alert she did wed philip the man she wanted to marry you brilliantly write in the book that the queen's marriage to philip was her greatest coup so can you explain that for us yeah i think that i mean i even see it now with my own husband and teenage daughter men do struggle do they not sure um, and their lovely little girls transition into young women and I think that George VI, who always had a great sense of inadequacy, was meant to be his brother Edward, as we know, the abdicated king who sat on the throne. And instead, it was this awkward, stumbling, stuttering man. And if you read his diaries and you do any deep reading around George, 
there's this idea that he can't really believe he's had these accomplished, relatively beautiful, I mean, Margaret was beautiful and Elizabeth was certainly attractive, socially adept women. How could he have created them? It's almost sort of like a marvel. And the idea that his peaches and cream, the pride and joy, somebody who really understood him. And we know that Elizabeth did mirror a lot of her reign on her late father, for better or for worse, because he was slightly out of date then. Um, for better or for worse, she adored him. To, to let her into the arms of this man who, with relative good reason, there were suspicions around his ability to be faithful. I argue that that really wasn't so terribly important. That the, the, in, in a in a marriage that is part of the constitutional role of monarchy, because you have to sire the heir, you know, and, and actually you have your consort or your liege man, etc. The, the, the marriage is bigger than just are you faithful or not? It's outward facing. It's an exemplar for the rest of the nation. It is a working marriage and a personal union. And I think he knew that. He obviously knew what was at stake. He had seen um, marriages come and go, fail or otherwise. And I think he just wanted a bit of breathing space for Elizabeth to go overseas. She'd never been overseas. So when they do this tour to predominantly to South Africa, I think it's a way of buying time. But how much time can you buy? You know what it's like when two people want to see each other. This is a really interesting um, recollection of Elizabeth looking back at England from the, the bow of the ship, because even though she's going on her first ever overseas tour, which is fairly unbelievable, it shows how sheltered their world was during the war. She's looking back, really just longing to be with Philip. And the irony is, of course, she's waited and waited for him to come back from war. He finally comes back and then she's whisked off to South Africa. It's almost like fate is destined, they'll always be apart. Incidentally, you mentioned that this is my first book on royalty. In fact, one of the reasons I wrote this book was because uh, I wrote Army Girls, which was um, I, I talked mm -hmm. to 17 women who were over at the age of 19, all the Queen's generation, who served in the ATS, which was the service the Queen served in during the war. And it really drew home to me I went and looked at her military archive the Queen's military archive etc just how sheltered her upbringing had been even for example when she finally is allowed to sign up and serve for her nation a woman in uniform aged 18 unlike the other girls who share barracks together and that's where they get to know each other they have their giggles their laughs they talk about normal stuff that girls teenage girls talk about she is whisked home to the castle every night she doesn't even get the chance to hang out with her peers when she's 18. And prior to that, she's educated privately within the castle. So let's not underestimate just how sheltered she was. George recognizes that. So then to release her to this one and only man she's ever found attractive, you can see why he felt the stakes were really raised and he wanted to protect her. Let's talk about her ring for just a second. Uh, you know, we all recognize the famous sapphire engagement ring that the Princess of Wales wears, but I think Elizabeth's ring is one that we don't talk about as much. And her engagement ring was a three carat diamond flanked by clusters of smaller pave diamonds. And she wore that ring for the rest of her life. So can you tell us how it suited her so perfectly? I think I mean, you are unencumbered by snobbery in America. Well, perhaps you have a little bit of snobbery, but I tell you what, it's embedded into our constitution almost, the class <laughs> system. I mean, it, it is, I mean, things are changing, of course, but the royal family is a reminder we can never really run that far away from it. And certainly for Philip, who was seen as a bit parvenu, who was this kind of prince without a realm, it was very important for him to prove that his mother, Alice, was, a, you know, of credible stock, and that she had these jewels, which I think there weren't as many as she thought she had. They'd been shored up in, a, I think, a French banking vault. And he had to go and retrieve them. Or did he retrieve them from a London bank via France? I can't remember the full story now. I wrote about it in the book. But um, but they're sort of dating back to Romanov heritage. This is the real deal. You don't want to be buying your jewellery, darling, if you're posh. You know, this <laughs> is something that one hands down. You know, it's an heirloom. It's proof that you come from the equivalent royal stock. And I think for Philip, that was as somebody who really owned his own MG, I think, and that was it. He had nothing beyond the jacket on his back and the car he drove, that he could provide a wedding ring with top end royal associations, courtesy of his mother, who, as I said, was born within the royal, the royal palace walls. This was an important symbol of his legitimacy 
because it's not just about money far from it it's about your breeding where you come from that's why for all that the royal naysayers there is this inexplicable thing where we're in a democracy and as i mentioned we had our first female leader democratic or otherwise before you and yet there are if you drill into it these irrational some people would say unsavory aspects of hereditary monarchy it is not equal in britain and it can't be as long as we have the royal family. Some people are literally born to rule. And Philip had to sort of, I think this was a way of proving, sealing that deal, that he was uh, the legitimate bridegroom to Britain's number one blushing bride. And I, I think we all try and sort of suggest, oh, the Queen's the every every man's granny, you know, because she, she never really expressed her political opinion very cleverly, and therefore we could all project ideas onto her that we wanted to. But she came from the same class as Philip, you know, hunt and shoot and fishing. I sometimes get asked to do in Britain to be what's called a talking head, where I go on documentaries about mm-hmm. the royal family. And so, for instance, we'll go on and we'll be talking about um, uh, Sandringham, which was their country estate in Norfolk. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons they loved that was because they got to shoot lots of pheasants. And I'm never allowed to mention anymore that they love shooting because it's gone so totally out of fashion. It's like we're sort of pretending they were something they weren't. They were a class apart. You know, and the the ring is kind of part of that narrative. They were from a different draw, the top draw, and I'm from somewhere in in the middle draw. You know, and and this is unsavory when we're in a world where it's about meritocracy. You know, pulling yourselves up by your bootstraps. It's not that that isn't possible, but it's just that Philip and Elizabeth, who let's remember married well over seventy years ago, lived in a different royal world in a different time. Mm-hmm. Well, in the book, you quote someone, I believe it was in the lead up to their wedding, as saying whether he was meaning in love with her, I couldn't say, but she was in love with him. So I don't think anybody's questioning. You've made it very clear, even in this conversation, that she was besotted with him. Were they equally besotted with each other? Well, yeah, I think what I try to explain is that we love in different ways and we love for different reasons. And Elizabeth, I don't know if she, I don't think she always probably fancied Philip. I mean, it's quite difficult, isn't it, to fancy your spouse after, after a certain number of decades. <laughs> but um, <laughs> certainly it helps at the beginning, at least. And I think certainly she was pretty head over heels on Philip. He's a very good looking man. Um, mm-hmm. And funnily enough, he, he remained very good looking. I always think it's a sign of someone who, well, certainly cares about what he looks like. It's very unusual to find a heterosexual man who has the same waist measurements when he's 90 as when he's 19 and Philip did boast that so he's the man who really took care about the way he looked and he it mattered greatly to him how attractive he was and the queen bought into that now we know that the queen was always a little bit more frumpy and in fact I you know I I cite examples of people saying she she, I think we find it hard to imagine that we ever criticized her now because she seems she talks to the sort of playbook of the best of British and she was remarkable in so many ways I think I don't know any Brit even Republican Brits and we call Republicans people who don't believe in the royal family over here I don't know any who um who didn't have respect for the Queen but certainly in the 50s and 60s she was considered a bit frumpy a little bit jaded you know sort of of the of the Debs wore sort of cardigans and flat shoes and and wasn't really the sparkling princess that had got married a decade earlier and was I think anxious and I think Philip perhaps we don't we'll never know well we will eventually know what happened behind closed doors but I think there are probably a number of reasons why we don't currently have access to his will Um, and there are good reasons why if people do know indiscreet stories about Philip that they wouldn't share those there is sort of almost cultish the very posh world um those most people I expect you interview in your podcast certainly I've heard a few um and and people like me we're not on the inside let, let's be clear and those that do and um Connor for example who who have been on the inside will be very selective about what they share I spoke to a Polish countess who knew the family very well and she told me some things and I said, oh, can I can I quote you? And she said, no, because then I would stop being invited to the dinner parties. So I think mm. we have to be aware that discretion is highly valued in the royal family. And what actually happened, we know that they had a successful marriage, a fecund marriage, four children, a marriage that lasted. 
and that was the the idea of marriage that they sold to us and they didn't ever pretend it was rosy on their 25th wedding anniversary and as I mentioned in the book on their 50th wedding anniversary um Philip especially said you know the, the queen was is very tolerant and read into that what what you will mm. the queen by the way you know she had that quite sullen look sometimes <laughs> she didn't look best pleased when he said that I think it was in Banqueting Hall um, it was in uh, 1997, which hadn't been a good year. Of course, Diana had died a few months earlier. But uh, it, the, the royals played by different rules. And the, the upper classes, I think, always gave less regard to ideas of fidelity than the middle classes did, certainly by the 1950s. Those sort of bourgeois marriages where the perfect housewife expected her husband to come back to the office and commit solely to her. These were quite new ideas and they were... Did, they, they weren't ideas that took root um, in the upper classes initially. I think by the time Charles and Diana come along, we have very different ideas right through um, society about what we expect from a marriage and infidelity is, is less tolerated. But uh, as I say, there is no concrete proof of Philip's infidelity. I, must, I would like to stress mm. that. Well, the wedding was called The Wedding That Belongs to the World by the Daily Mirror. What is your favorite detail from their wedding day on November 20th, 1947? I love that in her carriage when she was traveling, they were going to go um, down to Hampshire to stay in Lord Lou Mountbatten's um, house, Broadlands. I say house, but more like a mansion. And that was where they're going to have the first bit of their honeymoon, which was actually turned over by the press in a harbinger of things to come, to be honest. But she travels in a carriage where she's got a hot water bottle under her dress because it was November. And I think, you know, it's extraordinary, isn't it, really? And it shows the, the extent to which she was just really keen to crack on with Philip and married life. Because bearing in mind, you know, there wasn't reliable contraception. You couldn't do things before marriage. You had to wait till after marriage. So that's one of the reasons why brides get married so young in those days. The real fun begins after the wedding night or during it. <laughs> and um, and she has this hot water bottle. And I think, why were they getting married on this really dismal grey November day? And it's because they simply didn't want to wait. Mm. So there she is requiring hot water bottles up her skirts to keep her warm <laughs> on the way to the train station to arrive in Broadlands. And then they do have this quite horrid time where the location of their honeymoon is leaked to the press and everyone sort of storms the church and and Philip never, never finds the press easy. And that's another thing that's interesting in that Elizabeth, we know, doesn't discover she's going to accede to the throne until she's 10. But nonetheless, she's the only progeny, really, or she's the next progeny in line because Edward never had children from her birth onwards. And so she's always been in the public eye and she sort of wore the press necessarily like it, but she wore it like a second skin. It was something always there to be tolerated. She'd never known a world without it. And Philip, you know, on their, the honeymoon, not the honeymoon, on his stag party night, he sort of removes the, the flash bulbs from the press's cameras and stuff after he's given them a photograph. He has a little truck for them. And I think that's another reason why he gets a relatively unsavoury press is that it's it's not something he was born with. He might have been born with that around, but at least he didn't have press intrusion. Mm. And he, I think he always felt he was being stitched up. You know, it's that could we trust Philip? You look at the, the stories I've just told you, you know, that sort of followed him around. And to an extent, I have a degree of compassion for Philip, actually. No one's marriage is perfect. You know, and the pressure on a royal marriage where it is, as I've mentioned, a job as well as a personal union. Even the pressure, you know, any married couple, you know, if they want children and, you know, you have to, even that is a pressure in a normal couple. But, 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 but imagine it in a royal family. You've got to give birth to the next head of state and then bring them up so they're not totally dysfunctional. Some are, mind you. Uh -huh. We won't mention which. <laughs> <laughs> um you know so so I think it, it's just I, I don't blame Philip for for his offishness and rudeness really is quite often rude to the the public because he felt I don't think he was given the warm embrace and and we know that Meghan Markle felt that and of course we live in a different time now and she doesn't have what Philip had which was this full-on commitment to monarchy they were it was along with their Christian faith um, that belief in monarchy, a belief in the role they were born into. They believed in that. They believed in their marriage. It might be a different version of marriage from bourgeois England. It might be. But they believed in their union. I really, that's the main takeaway from me. And I kind of got bored of, you know, reading through 
gossip, the did, did he or didn't he kind of stuff. It was kind of irrelevant because for them, I think there was there was bigger fish to fry, which was their union was a matter of state and one they both believed in. And I think I certainly know in, when I see relationships around me, those that work best are when there's common interest. And Elizabeth and Philip had common interest in spades. They really cared about the Commonwealth. They really cared about their royal brand, about Britain, about promoting Britain, both domestically and abroad. And they also had separate hobbies. And I think, again, it's, it's not rocket science. She loved horses. The Queen, one of the reasons I think the Queen stayed alive so long was because she had this proper hobby, divorced of red boxes and photo opportunities. She lived and breathed horses. Philip didn't. He loved polo. He loved yachting. He loved other things. Mm -hmm. And they and they lived in those very separate orbits. And I think mm -hmm. the, the Queen very sensibly didn't invade his space in those separate orbits. Well, before Elizabeth became queen, they had this idyllic time in Malta, just this really, really special time in their marriage where Elizabeth could just be a naval officer's wife, the normality of that. So why was this time in Malta so special to them? Now, I think, may I be bold here, I think you've swallowed the fairy story there. Because if you drill into the dates of when Elizabeth was in Malta, she wasn't in Malta very long. Most of the time that Philip was in Malta, she was in Britain. She had constitutional duties as her father's right-hand woman. Her father, by the way, lest we forget, not a well man. He's not a well man. He dies in 52. But in this period, Philip eventually comes back from Malta because George is so ill. She also has two young children, Charles and Anne. She goes over to Malta for periods, six-week periods, for example, at Christmas particularly, when she does have great fun. We know that because uh, they stay in, uh, originally, or Philip does in Mountbatten's house, and then he gets his own place. That doesn't go so well. You know, the idea of Philip having to share his quarters with his uncle. They've both got giant egos. Um, and I think it's great for Elizabeth, who's a conventional woman, to see her husband in charge of his naval vessel, really enjoying himself, really, really relishing life in the Navy. And I think retrospectively, they look back on that time with rose tinted spectacles because it was so short and because Philip did give up his position in the Navy. But I, I don't really buy that line of poor Philip. Oh, you know, you could have had this wonderful naval career. Oh, but I'm like, can you name any famous uh, Lord Admiral of the, of the Navy, for, for example, uh, uh, versus any Dukes of Edinburgh? You know, the yeah. platform he acquired as the Duke of Edinburgh was far greater than any platform he was going to be given in the Navy. Sure, he was going to have to curtail some of his schoolboy japes and some of the camaraderie, which I know that sense, keen sense of belonging you get in the military. But also, it gave him time away. Most of the time, he's not with his young family, which 1950s men like Philip find quite boring, by the way, being with young family. And incidentally, when Elizabeth did go and stay with him in Malta, she left Charles and Anne behind. She left them at Sandringham for Christmas with their grandparents. Well, that carefree time in Malta ended in February of 1952 when it was Philip, while in Kenya with Elizabeth, had to break the news of King George VI's death to the new queen. So you write that Philip looked as if the whole world had dropped on his shoulders. How was he there for her in the toughest moment that that she had faced in her life at that point? Well, I think I'm, I'm, I mentioned it earlier. Some I think feel occasionally. Forgive me, I've preempted some of your questions with some of my earlier answers. But that is shortly after that period that they go to America together and they go to Canada, and both the Canadian and the American press picking up on this very young, vulnerable, inexperienced princess, shored up by this confident man who holds his own in the navy, who's lived in several countries, who knows himself. And is five years older than Elizabeth. And that's that's a lot when you're uh, 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 somebody in your early 20s. And so he supports her. But what's interesting is when George dies, you know, they're called back. I think they're in Kenya at the time. They've just started on this world tour. It's it's Philip that is the one in, in shock. And Elizabeth very quickly gets her head around the constitutional ropes and leans into the role of monarch 
because it's all set out. That's the thing about monarchy. A lot of we've seen a huge amount of pageantry and ceremony over the last few years. And it's about the idea of a session. Yes, we bury the queen, we respect the queen, but all those symbols of monarchy, the scepter and the crown, etc., that don't get buried with her, that's about continuity, one monarch to the next. But that can leave your liege man of life and limb feeling a little bit at sea. What is Philip's role when his wife's role is so set? And yeah. even just on a domestic level, we know he loved living in Clarence House, which is where, um, interestingly, Charles is now, and he isn't going to move into Buckingham Palace. But back then, Winston Churchill, again, you see problematic always for, for Philip, Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill insists, no, 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 the monarch has to live in Buckingham Palace. So they leave this house that Philip was very, very happy in. He loved living in um, in Clarence House. He'd got it all rigged out with mod cons and walkie talkies and rewired. And suddenly he's told, no, you've got to go back to that blooming, awful Buckingham Palace, you know, with all the stiffs and the long corridors. It's like living in a museum, as somebody once said. And, and even that made him feel desperately miserable. So there were things he had to adjust to. I know that we can say overall, you know, let's not cry for Philip. He had a really good life. I'm in no doubt about that. Did, d did Philip have a great life? Yeah, Philip had a great life. But there were compromises and sacrifices. And being a man of a certain ilk, of a certain time, born as a prince, he, he didn't always adjust quickly or gracefully to those changes. Well, as we have just had this coronation last May of King Charles, Prince Philip took a lead role in planning Queen Elizabeth's coronation back in 1953. So I, I really am interested in your answer to this question because Philip is a type A guy, right? But he is yeah, in alpha. a, he's in a, alpha. yeah, but he's in a type B role, right? And that's, that's a, that's an incongruence there. How did he handle being a consort? Well, on that day of the coronation, he was grumpy as hell. I mean, people commented <laughs> on it. He didn't, he didn't get the, the photographer he wanted. It was Cecil Beaton in the end, and that wasn't, it didn't get his friend. He wanted one of his friends. We know he had these <clears throat> famous meetings and friends, and 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 he, he didn't get his way. So he was very huffy. Um, and I think also he was probably a bit anxious. He wanted the day to go well, and there was a lot at stake. It, did, I think, if you look overall, their marriage was a success and he adjusted, but I think it took him a while. We know it took him a while and he found alternative roles for himself. You know, he he learned to fly again, much to the chagrin of, of Churchill, who was like, God, why do I want a dead duke? It's the last thing I blooming need when I've got to organize a coronation. And actually I made a mistake in my book, by the way. Oh, really? Um, I subsequently discovered, yes. And it's too late to, to reprint it now. Do <laughs> Maybe tell. the next reprint. I said that he, at the same time in the coronation, he he learned then also there's the helicopter debacle where the, certainly they didn't want him in a helicopter. It's even more dangerous learning to fly in a helicopter. But that came after the coronation and I got my dates muddled, so I have to apologise for that. But basically, that kind of whole flying story was an example of just how Philip is, I mean, he's he loves danger. He likes living life on the edge. We know he never wore a seatbelt. We know he always drove fast cars. He wanted to get what's the most dangerous way of traveling, especially back then, in an aeroplane. So he wants to fly. And that always sort of brings him up against authority. Yet at the same time, he's part of the establishment. So there's this interesting contradiction when it comes to Philip. And there's a slight feeling that he believes he's above the rules. And to an extent, he is. If you read one of his Ecuries accounts, you know, if the police stopped him because he was speeding, which he often was, he said, I'm the Duke of Edinburgh and he got away with it. D that doesn't happen. And subsequently has been done for speeding. It doesn't happen in the same way today. But back then the rules were slightly different. Well, we've got one final question for you as we wrap up our time with you. We've talked a lot about the love story of Elizabeth and Philip, but I just want to know what is your favorite anecdote or detail about their love story? I like their realism. That's mm. what I like about them. I like that they're, you know, they manage to keep a lot of it private. And that's partly because they're in a privileged position. They were able to. But also they, I think they got the balance right in terms of sharing with us, but not oversharing. And, I think, you know, the other thing is that no marriage is perfect and you have to respect a couple who hold it together and they held it together 
and they they were to an extent honest you know where he goes you know the queen has tolerance and abundance or that famous line he delivered in in 1997 you know the idea and the, and the queen was big she was big on having little faith not showy faith but little private christian faith and she believed in a christian union and i think that tolerance is part of a of a Christian or a loving, generous union, and and forgiveness if, if that's required sometimes, and very much that was their unique selling point that they were capable of loving each other, forgiving each other, and understanding that together they were greater than the sum of their parts. And I think most of us know who are in relationships that when those relationships go well, we're greater than the sum of our parts. And I think Philip and Elizabeth were a really good example of that. Well, I loved this book and it's been out for what, a little over a year now, I think the spring of 2023. And it just is still such a good read because this is a love story that will, it's just a, a once in a lifetime, once in a generation love story. It will never not be something I want to read about, even though both the late queen and Philip have passed away. And the book listeners is called Elizabeth and Philip, a story of young love, marriage and monarchy. It is out right now. And thank you so much for being here today. Your, your knowledge and expertise is just second to none. And it's a beautiful love story that deserves to be remembered. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. And I should say just finally, um, I do think that because their marriage was so successful, um, and 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 long and held up as the idyll from the 1950s onwards i mean from the 1940s onwards that did make it particularly hard for their children times had changed so rapidly the idea of the fairy tale royal wedding was frozen in aspic but actually if you look at the social revolution that took place on the ground through the 50s the 60s and the 70s so that our ideas of what we expect from our partner and from a marriage have totally been turned on their heads but yet we still had this absolutely frozen ideal of what we wanted or expected from a royal wedding. And I think that made it almost near impossible for their children to go forward and and, and marry and stay married successfully. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Just so much to think about, but just a love story that, again, deserves to be remembered. And I'm glad that it is done just that in your book. So thank you again. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.